Perdersi nella quotidianità significa continuare a sognare, ascoltare se stessi o ascoltare attorno che cos'è per noi la cucina, che cos'è per noi il mondo alimentare. Il pane secco, cioè il pane del giorno precedente, può diventare oro per tante persone. E allora da dove si parte? Thank you to the Phi Center for organizing such an important conversation. Um, this is a personal mission for me and a professional mission. Uh, the James Beard Foundation, which is a center of gastronomy in the United States, but certainly with a world purview, um, has been in front of this concept, this question, not just of food waste, but of really the role of chefs in changing the world we live in. Um, they've made it a more delicious place, certainly, but in, in recent years, chefs have... Um, sort of grasp the power both of their celebrity but also of the day-to-day -day things that they do, the interactions, the community, the businesses, the economics of what it means to be a chef and have transformed that or used that platform increasingly to become advocates of change or doers of change, not just advocates, makers of change. Just to, to put out a few statistics about food waste specifically, it's estimated between 35 to 50 percent of all food that is produced is, goes to waste. No one ends up eating it. Um, some of that happens in the developing world or in much of the world before it comes to market. Some of that happens at market or in production or when we're um, processing it into some other form. Um, Um, and in the developed world, unfortunately, where we are, are, in fact, fortunate to live, much of that happens after it's purchased and goes home. And even if you go to the green market and buy the freshest, most local, sustainable food with the best intentions, sometimes you don't get around to using it and it ends up um, in the garbage. That's just one very small piece of a system that produces a lot of waste. So I'm going to start, since Massimo has come the farthest, um, I'm going to start with a question for you, Massimo. And I know that in your food and your restaurant and also um, in the work that you do, you are always, um, in some ways, acknowledging the shoulders you stand on, the, the chefs you worked with, the people who have inspired you. And I want to, you to reflect a little bit, when you started to become interested in food and to cook, did you ever think that, that charity, that homelessness, that um, environmental activism and sustainability would be part of the recipe about, about what you would produce? <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a minute and a half. Yeah, uh, a minute and a half. Okay, that's fine. My answer is no. <laughs> but, but, I was born, I grew up, and uh, I live in Modena. Modena is in the middle of Emilia Romagna, and is a place that is extremely social, uh, with Bologna and Reggio Emilia, and uh, is a place uh, in uh, also in which. Uh, You spend time around the table, you dream together with the family, you care about the family because, uh, you know, the family is, is the family. And uh, you share with your family, you fight, you dream, you plan the future. Uh, it's a place where killing a pork that uh, is like, is a, is a very important moment of life because that animal is giving uh, is life to you, and you have to use every single element. So for us, uh, uh, making coppa di testa, that means uh, boil the, the head of the pork, drain it, and let him sit for a couple of weeks before start uh, uh, slicing, uh, is one part. The other part is the broth. So when winter is hard, You know, this broad that is the glaze and it can warm you up, especially in front of uh, a Camino and with the older family. So that means everything goes here because cooking is uh, an act of love. And uh, this is the point. So uh, I come from uh, this kind of heritage. So that's where I wanted you to start because what you've just, you've just described a dish, let's say, yeah. but you've actually described a whole social system, a worldview yes. yes. about what it means to have, to produce, to serve, to save, to, to nourish others. And in fact, you centered it around the respect for an animal, the pig that yeah. we've killed. Jeremy, you did something magical today with a cod, a fish, I understand. <laughs> um, smaller, perhaps, able to feed fewer than a whole pig, maybe not a whole year, but, but t t tell us about where you come from and what the respect for 
Uh, a cod means. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're way out in the Atlantic Ocean, in the middle of, of nowhere, and the codfish is, um, yeah, it's, it, when you say fish back home, it means codfish, and uh, it's fed people for generations, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a religious thing, really. Codfish is Newfoundland. My grandmother is, you know, pretty amazing woman and, and she really kind of installed in me so many wonderful things and, and how to respect codfish is one of them and using today we celebrate a cod using it nose to tail you know and, and using every part of the codfish besides using the filet which you'd get at a, a supermarket or a fishmonger it's uh, you know it's a very common thing but uh, to be able to use the whole cod the napes the sounds all the pieces that are discarded or thrown over the side of a boat is kind of a, a special thing and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it, was, it was nice to be able to do that. So in, in the history of gastronomy, which is different from what you've described in some ways, um, both of you, this sort of respect, this almost peasant appreciation of food from places of long traditions where lots of people had to eat in good times and bad. Um, restaurants have for a long time occupied a very different place. That's where we indulged, where we, we went to throw out all of those other parts and just eat the center things and, and that, that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if we may, um, a new restaurant here, a new idea of a restaurant. If John, you might talk to us a little bit about a young, being a young chef and this, this moment we find ourselves <laughs> where gastronomy includes the sort of traditions that, that they've described, but also has to bring people in to pay money for dinner what we do or what we're trying to do at the restaurant is kind of have an idea of gastronomy is um, that it's not just there to please you, it's there to nourish you as well. It comes from Jean-Briard Savarin's definition of gastronomy, which is take the best of what you can to nourish mankind. And I think for me, that's what the definition or the idea around the restaurant is. So what we do is we say, okay, for to sustainably run a restaurant and sustainably run a food system, we need to eat pretty much 80% plants. So we serve 80% plants. We want zero waste, so we serve, we only have six plates on the menu. So you never have, everyone eats basically the same thing. And what we try to do is then, because we're a new country here in Canada, we've been around for a couple hundred years, but in Europe you have generations and generations and generations and a uh, culture that comes from when there was no time of abundance. So we kind of think about if a millennia long food culture had developed in Montreal around plants, around kind of like not having what you need, what would that look like? What would a contemporary version of that look like? Antonio, uh, you are the product of many different cultures, in fact, where you've lived, where you're from, where you work. Um, a little bit of your perspective when it comes to creating a gastronomy um, of uh, all of these different cultures here in a city, itself a multicultural city and a country known for um, many different things, if not <coughs> one type of food. How do you approach something like that? The, the, the approach for me, it's really going back to my roots, really going back to who my mother and my father and how I grew up when, when I was a kid and uh, really <clears throat> using my culture and not trying to create something new. I'm not trying to create anything new. I'm just trying to put things out there. Every meal that I had with my mom and my dad, they always used to talk about the war because South Korea went through a lot of war. And they used to say, what's the best thing that you can do to keep fruits vegetables and meat or fish and during the war. So it was about fermenting, pickling, and preserving. So a lot of Korean, South Korean background food, when you look at it, they're all kind of like preserved and pickled and fermented. For example, the kimchi. The kimchi is just, you know, it's a fermented with Napa cabbage. We ferment with so many different things, but it lasts you for so long. And you can actually eat them for so long and it's actually healthy for you. Uh, so the, the idea of waste, I believe, is more like, how do we create something that we do not have to use it that day, but we can keep it through a long time? And I think that information is kind of getting lost 
because the new generation didn't go through that trouble. Well, and I think it sort of speaks to one of the challenges that we have as folks living in a time of abundance, honestly, in a place where people have come from all the sorts of different traditions that you know, where it's meant, what it's meant to be a North American, an American, is to have not worry about where we're going to eat, not care, is how do we move forward as a chef? How do we move forward as a, a gastronomic community? And one of the things I'd like to ask you, Jean-Francois, is where does the sort of history of gastronomy from your upbringing come into play with the social, social gastronomy that you are partaking today? And tell us a little bit about that project. I grew up. Uh, I grew up around food. Uh, my mom was a great home cook. I always like uh, the end of the school day because I, first thing I wanted to know is what my mom was cooking, and coming into the home and putting my my uh, my hands in the plates and and tasting um, always was like that and always had that craving for 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 food. And then my dad was had was running two gastronomical clubs uh, when I was growing up um, and he had a lot of friends with wine and fancy food and I was, I was about nine, ten. And um, uh, I would ask him to go to the dinners when I got about 12, 13. He said no at first and then at 14, he got me into uh, some of the dinners. It's the first time I tasted foie gras with, uh, and that time I had a sip of Chateau d'Iquem. So imagine at 12, uh, tasting foie gras in, in Chateau d'Iquem. Um, like every 12-year-old. You know, and, 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 going in, and going into a kitchen where, where the executive chef is Normand Laprise and it's his first job as executive chef of a restaurant, his sous chef is Martin Picard. And his, it is, his other sous chef is David McMillan. So, so you can imagine that, that kitchen at the time and then seeing the generosity of the chefs, the passion they have for food. And that passion for me, you need to have respect for that. So for me, it was the base of what I wanted to create as a social movement, bringing these chefs together um, around these social issues that are so important. So, Massimo, I want I want to I want you to take us on a little bit of a journey from that those passatelli to the number two restaurant on the planet, according to some folks. Number one, according to some others. Uh, maybe number three, but we don't <laughs> listen to those folks. To some others, uh, and um, and. Explain to me uh, sort of that traje trajectory. Long time ago, was, uh, when uh, Ducasse was cooking at Hotel de Paris, I already worked with a French chef and Lydia Cristoni. So I was cooking a cuisine that was completely new in Italy, mixing French, uh, French uh, technique uh, to Italian tradition. So it was something that uh, Ducasse really, really loved. And uh, he said, uh, why don't you come with me and, uh, at the Hotel de Paris? That was uh, 1991, 92. And um, I said, yes, of course, uh, I will. I'm going to leave the restaurant. I'm going to leave mm -hmm. to Lydia for a little while, and uh, I'm going to come with you. And uh, I went there, and uh, that was uh, extremely crazy because uh, uh, <coughs> there was... Uh, uh, every lunch and every dinner, we were preparing uh, um, the mise en place for 60 people. And, uh, and even if uh, we had uh, one guest. So uh, every lunch and every dinner, we were <coughs> excluding Buta everything, buta revia, tutto. <laughs> and we were starting again uh, in the afternoon. Wow. That was... Uh, well, that a was a very, grand cuisine at, a, yeah, at that moment. That was... Uh, Unsustainable. Yes. <laughs> Ten years uh, later, I was in uh, El Bulli with uh, Ferran in 1999. And uh, in that moment, I understood that was not about the food, the message of Ferran, uh, because everyone thinks that it was all about technique and technique and technique and, uh, you know, surprise everyone. But it was not that. Mm -hmm was not that, was, uh, was the message, the most important message of uh, the kitchen of El Bulli was serving sardines, serving, uh, mm. you know, working class heroes elements. Mm. They were s explaining and, uh, and uh, 
giving you such uh, incredible emotion, much more than a, a bogavante like lobster or, or caviar. Or no, it was was just the, the message of freedom. Express yourself with freedom. I remember a broth. Of uh, we went to to the market one day to buy to get all the bones and collect all the bones from uh, La Bucadera, like the the market in Barcelona, <laughs> and uh, the bones from Amon Abugo, and uh, they were keeping for El Bulli, and we were making a broth with uh, this kind of bones. It was delicious. It was much better than bite a, 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 a piece of ham, you know. Um, so. That was a very important message that I got it, mm. and I and I came back to Modena and I start uh, cooking with that mm. and understanding that through a Parmigiano Reggiano crust bite, uh, I could transfer more emotion than uh, mm. you know with some crazy unsustainable fishing, you know. Right. At that point, getting uh, you know growing up. Uh, uh, getting together with the team, uh, 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 sharing ideas with Lara, uh, getting deep into art, uh, and special social artists mm -hmm. like Ai Weiwei and Joseph Boyce. You know, you, you see the world from another perspective, mm -hmm. from the perspective of culture. Mm -hmm. And from that moment, we start thinking in a social perspective. Uh, when uh, I realized that uh, uh, we could do much more than uh, just cooking, but influence people, mm -hmm. helping uh, you know the the slow food movement, <laughs> move uh, the spotlight from us to all the farmers, the fishermen, the cheesemakers, you know, and at one moment of your life, uh, you know, the earth starts shaking, and uh, 360 wheels of Parmigiano Reggiano are damaged and ready to be thrown mm -hmm. away. And the consortium is asking for help to you. You have to do something, you know, something for the others. And we re realize, uh, and we create a recipe uh, using lots, a lot, a lot of cheese. <laughs> and uh, and we 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 create uh, this recipe that became an icon, uh, and we present it at the slow food mo <laughs> night. And uh, in that night, uh, 20,000 people uh, cooked that recipe all over the world. In three months, we sold 360,000 wheels of Parmigiano Reggiano, all together, hmm. working together. No one lost the job, no cheese company closed the, the, the door. So from there, you know, we realized that we had something to say. Mm -hmm. And at, at the point, uh, we, uh, in Milan, Milan uh, open uh, the universal exposition with the team Feed the Planet. So thinking about my heritage as an Italian, as Leonardo, as uh, the soup kitchen he did uh, 500 years ago with the Last Supper and the monk tables, uh, very narrow and, uh, you know, full of art, of culture and things, we decide to do that. We decide to rebuild in the 21st century, something like that, inviting the best chef or the most influential chef in the world to cook the waste, the inevitable waste, from the Universal Exposition.